What you just watched was a movie, a pretty violent movie at that. <laughs> Sorry to fool you there for a second. This is Skinny E Media with Bobatron as usual with our BBFCV MPAA podcast talking about war. This means war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Again, don't give up your day job. <laughs> Absolutely there. I had to do something to at least try to get retention on these YouTube videos, do something a little bit more theatrical. So I went and done like a little sort of audio play of sorts. But that's not what we're really in for. We're more in for uh, talking about wartime cinema, which uh, has always had its demons, whether it be censored by the government, like uh, La Bate d'Alger um, in France, or films that had to be uh, nitpicked for certain bits of information that may be deemed sensitive to uh, uh, certain armed forces projects that were occurring in the day. I know all the war movies, at least like Top Gun, Black Hawk Down had to get at least clearance through not only MPA, but uh, certain military generals before we got ex- exhibited at cinemas. Yes, um, there's been a bit of a, um, I don't know, what's the word, Lee? A co- era of cooperation and quid pro quo between Hollywood and uh, the US military or the military industrial complex, where basically they've been allowed to use actual military uh, aircraft or technology or vehicles or equipment in their movies, but they have to portray the US military in a positive light. Something Michael Bay seems to uh, take to really take to heart. Oh, he revels in it. He uh, rubs it all over his chest and probably wags to it along with his Vaseline. That's a Shots of Megan Fox, but then also heavy explosions and uh, people shooting at tanks. Mm. It was like Iraq or Afghanistan. It's a little bit cynical, really. But I think when it comes to war... And flag and... shagging. Wait, is that in one of his movies? I don't literally mean someone shagging a flag. Have you not heard the term flag shagger? First time. Right, it's basically someone who just... Uh, it's just another uh, more facetious way of describing... Uh, Uber jingoistic flag waver. Oh, okay. Like uh, Donald Trump supporters, Nigel Farage supporters. They yeah, fit the exactly. definition of a nationalist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Uh, what can you do with these people? But on the flip side, um, you know, Scottish voters, SNP, they tend to be more left than Tories are. They're flag shaggers when it comes to the afraid of their freedom. I so. think the uh, context is somewhat different, though, given the circumstances. I mean, when it's a country that wants uh, independence for itself, yeah, it does tend to gravitate to leftwards. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what their nationalism is around, not foreigners F off home and ever, everything. Although I say that, but then again, the Confederate states wanted independence for themselves and they were no means left wing. <laughs> No, no serene. But it all ties together with our discussion about war, war, which makes people very frightened. But people often will be energized to fight the battle, no matter who the enemy is, because of government and media social conditioning. Now, which propaganda? The oh, of course, there. But it can go one or two ways, depending on how you look at it. So we'll start with the first question. As always, what was your experience with wartime movies or like battle films, or even video games, when you were growing up? Um, what was the first damn war film I saw? I can't even remember now. Well, there's a lot of U and PG certificate ones, like The Dam Busters and Zulu. Most people have seen either in school with their granddad. I've s- I haven't seen Dan Busters. I saw Zulu the first time when I was when I was eighteen. And everything my mate lent him on DVD. Um, yeah, uh, I didn't mind the film at the time being, but on reflection, it. Uh, I mean, it's a good film and everything, but obviously I don't like the morals it promotes because 
it's like glorifying Britain's colonial past. And it's portraying the British colonialists, colonists and colonial army as the good guys. And the Zulus are just trying to fight for their land and for liberation are seen as the bad guys. So I don't really like that too much. Yeah, a film like that probably would uh, not get as strong clearance from Hollywood nowadays because of some of the... Um, it's not perceived as politically correct. But uh, this is, I think... Well, that's one way to say it, yeah. Is, this was uh, way before the 2000s, 2010s, where a lot of that wasn't in people's minds, really. And a lot of war movies, at least back then, at least had some sort of white saviour narrative who would save uh, the lad from the natives. But the natives will always be sort of second in the background, while uh, Kevin Costner or uh, Daniel Day Lewis from uh, Last of the Mohicans, uh, Costner and Dances with Wolves, or take center stage. Uh, these were um, sort of wars that weren't the Second World War, First World. They were more of uh, the early days of America or Civil War, so to speak. Yeah, it's a really strange one. At least from my experience, most of the war movies that I grew up on were more or less not based off a particular event. I know ants had a uh, scene where <laughs> the um, ants were fighting a battle against some dung beetles that were spraying uh, termites. some liquid. Yes, the termites. Uh, I don't scene... think that counts as a war movie, to be honest. <laughs> well, you know, we're talking about when I was a child, early days. I didn't grow up on stuff like Dam Busters or Zulu or um, the Battle of Britain. Dr. Shivago or any of those when I was growing up. I know they were EU and PG certificates, but uh, none of them I, I really saw had much appeal to me. Uh, it, with war movies, it's a little bit here or there, really. I, I generally will pick on the ones that at least I've heard of or have been controversial. For well, anyone who's asking, what? Well, I was going to say, a lot of those movies were quite old-fashioned and black and white, and to, you know, I don't think they would have appealed too much to a young kid growing up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're probably quite good. Oh, well, of course. Um, a lot of people hold those films into a high regard, which we will talk about Dam Busters in just a moment because of the, some of the racist language you used. But um, for anyone who is curious, my favourite war movie, well, depending on which <laughs> war it actually is, if, if it's Vietnam, it's Full Metal Jacket. If it's uh, the Israel... Palestine, Lebanon conflicts, whatever you want to call it, it would be Walter of Bashir. If it was Iraq or Afghanistan, it would be Redacted, or perhaps um, uh, Team America. It's more satirical, but take it as you will. World War. Did I say World War Two? I can't. I don't think you have. You said Vietnam. You said Israel, Palestine, which are a bit controversial to be getting into. But I mean, you said uh, the. Uh, recent uh, W wars of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, no, I, I think that's all you've uh, said. You haven't mentioned uh, any of the world wars yet. WW2, um, well, let's be on the safe side. I'll, I'll say Dunkirk. Uh, that is probably Chris Nolan's best film. World War One is Death Watch, which I know people say is a horror movie. I didn't see it as a horror film. Well, I, uh, I, yeah, it's kind of both. Uh, Civil War, I guess the Free State of Jones. I like Dances with Wolves, but it is quite long. And uh, the only one I uh, I've just seen... cap it off, starting from the Great War. Well, I mean, if we're going to talk about the American Civil War, and I presume that's what you meant when you said Civil War, uh, the yes. only one I think I've seen is was it Cold Mountain? That one with um, uh, Nicole Kidman and Rennie Zellweger. Uh, yes, uh, weirdly enough, my grandmother has a copy of it on DVD. Um, from what I did remember... I oh, think... no, sorry, sorry, no, let me, let me, um, sorry, I stand back. I've just totally remembered The Good, The Bad and The Ugly is technically set around that time. Oh, it is? Hmm. Well, I, maybe in the slight aftermath. I mean, there's some, there's a battle scene involved in it, which is, looks like it's between um, unions and confederates. So I guess it's kind of during the American Civil War. I mean, it doesn't really dwell much on the actual battles themselves. It's more about the three main characters trying to get to a goal, but let's not get too done. But it, I think I, it may just count. Oh, yes, I, I totally understand. 
Um, well, it was always just some sort of element in the background. Uh, you know, maybe a bit prominent or not, or it's the catalyst for everything. We will count it in. Um, now, I know when it comes to war movies, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword because most of them will generate to get lower ratings than a regular film would because of the historical context. But that's not to say those films are milder than, let's say, Saw or Hostel. They can be just as bad. Sometimes uh, some of those films can be awfully horrific to watch. I know that a lot of people did not like Saving Private Ryan when it initially came out because it was too gory. Yeah, I had a... Yeah, I know. I'll... <clears throat> At the time it came out, the BBFC probably said not for the war context. It probably would have been an 18 during due to its uh, due to its violence. But yeah, thank, because it's like due to war context and the violence is there specifically to shock you and show you the horrors of war it got passed at 15 which does make a lot of sense when you think about it and obviously now with the bbfc being a lot more chill it would definitely be a 15 anyway oh yes i mean if they could pass stuff like dog soldiers and sisu 15 i'm sure they can pass over private ryan 15 as well oh sisu yeah that's a that's a good war film that is well i I liked that. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see it at the cinema, if anyone's listening to get a chance to see it at the cinema, just go see it, because it is fucking awesome. I've seen it myself. I had the privilege of it when I went to the BBFC event. For any of our fans who are listening, I uh, saw it before I saw the cocaine there, and that's my opinion. I thought, yeah, not too bad there. I was just happy to see it, because it was a Finnish language well, not language, but it was a Finnish film. And I got uh, connections with that country to some extent. So I'm kind of obliged to see it on the basis of that. I love Finnish films. Anyone that's listening, so are we. But uh, yes, if you do want to talk about that, you're more than welcome to. I know it's a 15. It is a very uh, violent, uh, quite heavy 15. But I guess because... There was that John Wick connection from what I was told from the behind the scenes. And because it's a little bit tongue in cheek, they probably said, OK, we let this pass. Well, I mean, it is very violent. Yeah. But then again, I don't think it's more violent. Than, it's not the most violent 15 I've ever seen, but that's, yeah, I mean, I don't know what it is, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure I really want to do it too much. I was going to go into some of my other... Uh, of favorite films regarding certain uh, wars in history. Uh, World War II, I... How many World War II films have I seen? I, was, I saw Saving Private Ryan only recently, and I do realize just how great a film that actually is. I guess that could be uh, my favorite. Obviously, Dunkirk and Imitation Game are pretty good, and um, I recently watched uh, Darkest Hour, uh, which is, um, yeah, quite a... Uh, Film World War One, the only one I've already seen is 1917. That was Boss, so yeah, got to give props to that. That's pretty good. Uh, favorite film set in the Iraq War is uh, Green Zone with Matt Damon. Have you seen that? <clears throat> that one I haven't, but I've seen The Kingdom and Redacted. Seen the Kingdom, Taxi yes. to the other side. Um, American Sniper. Which I'll I'll go into detail of that in a quite uh, quite a bit. <laughs> but the problem with like the Kingdom American Sniper, they do take the whole USA all the way bullshit and actually try to portray Americans' uh, war in the Middle East as well a good thing. Uh, Green Zone actually takes the anti-war message and uh, acknowledges and uh, emphasizes the blatant illegality of the Iraq War, which we cannot stress as enough was illegal as fuck. Easily. Um, 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 at least, weirdly enough, I've heard more people on the right who used to support it now starting to take aim and criticise the war for all of its wrong ends and means. Which is a bit weird, <laughs> considering they were all supportive of it. Well, no, well, the right... Left and the far right now supporting it for their own means. Well, the, um, the, the right wing has taken a, a swing... Uh, lean from neoconservative I mean we're getting a bit off topic but if we get from neoconservatism more on to sort of uh, uh, was it pillar conservatism or protectionism or um, they're taking their populace and of course <clears throat> they don't like yeah for that reason they don't like getting into uh, 
towards. I think we I mean both Trump and I think Nigel Farage. I don't know much about actually or at least are on record as saying they opposed the Iraq war and everything. Not generally because they didn't like the fact they were killing people in the Middle East, but because they probably thought it was fighting for Israel or something, or it was part of that whole New World Order bullshit, or or they worried that it might create a refugee crisis and those refugees might come here and they don't want that. Um, but getting off topic, yeah, the Iraq war was fucking evil, and I liked Green Zone because it did mention that. Although I think a lot of uh, war movies at the, at the time actually did sort of emphasise the illegality illegality of uh, America's foreign policy in the Middle East. No, um, a fair few of those that were brave enough to do so did, but a lot of them failed at the box office because the politics was a little bit too on the nose, which is an ultimate fate that what happened to um, Redacted over, like you said, Green Zone or American Sniper or a- Active Valley, which is just shameless. It's a recruitment video for the Navy SEALs, but Redacted is one that was by Brian De Palma before his career turned to the toilet. That is one of the most disturbing 15 certificate films I have ever seen. I just, I got it from the charity shop after years of not having seen it. It's got a very prolonged scene of sexual threat and, you know, quite a full rape scene um, between, sort of like a gangbang between two soldiers involving a 50-year-old girl and there's also a lot of gun threat and racial slurs against Arabs. And there's a really uh, horrible scene of beheading as well that also looks to you quite realistic. And I thought, yes, it's a war movie with a uh, 15 context because it's portraying the political ramifications behind it. But I thought that movie was just disturbing and horrifying to watch. I, I had a bit of a weird uh, Elfin Lee flashback in, in many ways of, OK, maybe I shouldn't have seen this. So it's going to play with my mind a bit. That I guess that uh, I mean, guess well, I I can appreciate that. I I can understand that, appreciate that. I mean, I suppose you know I can go through all the various different wars throughout history and everything, and say which one was my favourite. Which I guess for each uh, represent each war. I suppose I'm going to be pretty basic here and say that my favourite ever ever war movie, uh, or for um, ever all time, is probably going to be Braveheart. They'll never take our freedom. It's a yeah. 15 certificate, but it was deemed a very violent one at the time. It was cut to get a, a 15. The scene where Wallace slashes the English sheriff's throat uh, was um it t- was cut to get a, a a 15. It's not cut anymore, but I mean, uh, yeah, it was cut at the time to avoid an 18. But apparently, I think it was even cut even before and anyway to avoid an NC-17 in America. At least I that's what I've heard. I mean, like I say, it is massively violent, and it probably just gets away with a lot of it due to the historical context, even though it is one of the most historically inaccurate movies ever made. No, I'm afraid you're right. Uh, there was room, uh, well, Wikipedia depends on how you take the source. Most uh, universities won't, but it does say it was censored to avoid NC-17, but many people deemed it at the time, with its already cut to be one of the most violent <laughs> war movies ever made. But when you look at it today, it, it's not that bloody. And I think that kind of throws people off a little bit. Well, you've still got stuff like Saving Private Ryan on uh, Fury, Hacksaw Ridge. Hacksaw Ridge was done by Mel Gibson. Uh, people sort of flip the script a little bit. I mean, in all fairness, there was more blood in uh, Sisu and Hacksaw Ridge than there was in Glorious Bastards, but when Glorious Bastards was kind of playing with history a bit because it's Tarantino, it's a bit weird like that. A little mm-hmm. bit more sort of sadism, while in Hacksaw Ridge it was just graphic shootouts and explosions and bombs on the war field. It's a, yeah, it's I, a, I, haven't, I haven't seen either of those two trip. films, so... Hacksaw Ridge or Fury. I, I can't really comment on either of those two um two movies, I'm afraid. Early, I mean, I probably should watch them. The problem with most war films, I find, is that they do tend to be quite long. I mean, three, it seems like three hours is ra- is less the an exception rather than norm. I'm afraid you're right. Um, a lot of the films in question usually run for a long time because it makes it seem like it's a 
majestic, powerful film that will win lots of Oscars and Golden Globes. Oh, don't get me wrong. They totally, the ones I've seen totally warrant their their runtime. I mean, both uh, Good, Bad, the Ugly and Saving Private Ryan and Braveheart have complete. You know, they've, they've warranted their um the lengthy times. I can't think of anything that would have been cut and the movie wouldn't have suffered for it. So, yeah, I have to admit. Well, uh, yeah, I, I get what you mean. But at the same time, there are short war movies. Redacted, that was about an hour and 26. Is it? Um, it does feel a bit on the slow side because it uses different um, cameras and video mediums to try to create a collage of Oh, who did this? Is kind of done now. The testimonies. It's a little bit Rashomon esque in some ways. Um, and then Dunkirk was about, about hours, an hour, and, hour and forty five, which it? for the Chris Nolan movie is actually quite impressive. That's probably why I like it because unlike some of his other films, uh, Dunkirk is lean, mean, and to the point, and it's not. A obsessed with trying to make too much of a spectacle out of stuff. I know a lot of people like Dark Knight, and, and I know you do too, but I've, I've it is done good. It's a bit more of a special place in my heart for also another reason. My uh, paternal great-grandfather, God rest his soul, he died on uh, Dunkirk mission, killed by the Nazis in 1941, I believe. So that film has a bit of a personal place. In the same way that uh, one could argue MASH has a bit of a personal place because my grandfather maternally were fought in Korea. Well, yeah, I mean, I can imagine, uh, imagine it would. I mean, I've, I, my grandparents, oh, well, after my grandparents would have been in World War Two. at least my uh, paternal granddad did fight in World War II. Well, I've, as you can imagine, he survived. He uh, only died in 2005. Um, yeah, so I mean, I don't really say much personal connection to these uh, to the these wars. I mean, obviously they're a, a long time ago. Uh, I mean, just uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. I think I just uh, don't know where I'm going with this particular uh, uh, train of thought. I mean, one thing I was going to say. I mean, it might seem kind of weird about being an Englishman that I am. My, I really like Braveheart so much, and yes, when I was younger, I did used to find it a little uh, aggravating watching the English people portrayed as bad guys like that. Obviously, as I'm older, now I understand better, but I suppose you want in the English equivalent of Braveheart, there's always the 2010 Robin Hood film. Take from the rich, give to the poor. Um, you could say there are war elements, but it's more sort of um, folklore, somewhat fantasy. I'm not well, so I'm... sure, but well, Unless this say the, folklore. well, this is the one that's all grounded in... I am talking about Ridley Scott one of Russell Crowe and Kate Blanchett in. Oh, yes, of course. There's a, um, a 12 and a 15 version. Yeah, I oh no, There was an extended version. That was a bit where uh, had a bit more to it. But, I mean, of course, when I look at, like, um, how it's uh, how he makes that big uh, speech at the end, it says, every Englishman's home is his castle and everything, and then they all rally up together to fight off a French invasion of um, of England. It's like... It really is an English Braveheart. I mean, it's just, it's just how only way I could see it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm eating right now, but I'll take your word for it there, because um, I have not seen many Robin Hood interpretations except for Prince of Thieves and that Men in Tights one and that <laughs> the Kingsman boy. But yeah, uh, hmm. it makes you wonder a bit about things. Um, I Jerry. Not a big fan of uh, nationalist type films because it can seem one sided, but at the same time, it is a part of cinema history, and there's no way you can sort of try and scale it back a little bit. I mean, look at how many British people of a certain generation hold um, damn busters in high regards, despite that being a use certificate film. Now, in recent years, it's PG. Probably so it because of the use of the N word. Yep, the dog. Um, his name rhymes with Trigger. Or at least that's what they'll call him when Peter Jackson does the remake at some time. I, there's rumours about that, but yeah, it's uh, awfully frequent. I actually heard about that scene. That's probably why I never saw it as a child. Maybe that's why. But yeah, um, they mentioned that on a BBFC seminar when I went there in June 2013. One of the best days of my life. 
that particular scene and how um, in a modern day context that probably wouldn't work well, but because it wasn't submitted again for uh, exhibition, the U still standard as it did from, I think, the, the 50s or maybe early 60s. But it's sort of a known quantity in the same way that Jaws, if you base it to 15, it kind of throw people off, even though I do think Jaws should be a 15. But that's beside the point. Um, and then Battle of Britain, that was, I think, uh, I don't know if it's a U certificate, because I saw it in America. It was given a G rating, but they had quite a bit of violence. I think even a few blood spurts, and there was even a scene with naked children. I thought, oh, that doesn't sit well with me. No, thank you. Uh, like I say, I haven't seen a lot of those films. Like I haven't really seen a lot of old-timey... Um... Uh, what's it? Oh, also, I think it is the uh, it is a U rating that Battle of Britain film from nineteen sixty nine. Sixty nine. Yeah, that does seem like that's a, a U rating. I haven't seen that. I don't, like I say, I haven't really seen a lot of these old timey war films and everything. Uh, in fact, I just don't think how many war films I've seen. I've seen more modern ones. Like I've seen Black Hawk Down, um, A Sword of the Kingdom, and everything. Uh, what else have I seen? Well, you like um, the Vietnam stuff, like Full Metal Jacket? Or I haven't, I stuff. haven't, well, that's the thing, I haven't seen either of those two. My, my closest connection to watching any Vietnam films are Rambo and Forrest Gump. That's fine. We, that's fine. No, no, I'm not, no, I mean, I don't mean I was to get aggressive, I'm just saying that's just a, that's about the extent of my um, cinematic uh, experience regarding that particular point in history. Oh, no, 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 and um, Born on the Fourth of July, seen that as well. And I think that's quite a pivotal one. It's not really a set, doesn't really take place much in the war, although there is a bit of it. It's more about the uh, effect the war was having on America at home. But I think that's relevant. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Tom Cruise, I know he's a Scientologist, has made some films that are quite progressive-minded, particularly Born on the Fourth of July, which uh, Oliver Stone, we already know what he's like. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he, 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 uh, he is. Before I mean, he sold himself to Putin and God knows what. But yes, he used to uh, be a big name in the 90s and some part of the 80s with his uh, conspiratorial left-wing anti-war anti-government movies we need a, a new oliver stone nowadays it just isn't one but yeah that's a, i think it was an 18 on the basis of uh, violence and language but i i doubt it would be a 18 nowadays i mean full metal jacket was much harsher but that got a 15 on re-release like since 2008 or 9 and that that movie kind of fucked me up in my head a little bit because there was a uh, graphic suicide, um, scenes of racial fetishism and a lot of swearing and um, people being, I think one person is implicitly decapitated, but yeah, it's quite ruthless. But at the same time, it's very funny. It's a satire in many ways. Stanley Kubrick's best film, in case anyone asks. Which was, a, sorry, did you say Full Metal Jacket? Get out of Get back what? up, Paul, Paul, get your ass up. Yes. Bearing in mind, I haven't seen that. Bear in mind, like I said, I haven't seen that film. I haven't seen a lot of films uh, surrounding the, or regarding the uh, Vietnam War. Like I said, it's just uh, Born on the Fourth of July, Forrest Gump, because it takes place during the uh, Vietnam War, and he's, uh, and he's, well, taking place in it and everything. And of course, uh, Rambo, but that's, uh, or First Blood and everything, but that's more about him being a traumatized veteran who's come home and has been forgotten by the system. Although his rant at the end seems to be a bit more about the fact that he's pissed off he's not back over there killing more Viet Cong people than, uh, than actually like the, he ever went to the war to begin with. Well... War can change a man. I think that could be said about anyone, really. Um, I will say, from my experience, the first Rambo movie um, is certainly much different than the others, which were much yeah. added on the violence and the uh, nihilism. But the first and it was, was good. quite contemplative and quite upsetting, because there was that scene, like you said, where he rants about, I had to come back from war, and all I could do was, podcast and starts crying. And that PTSD is painted on his head. And that scene, frankly, is quite upsetting to watch because it is quite realistic. Because a lot of 
these young lads came back home, they were viewed as the enemy to some extent because they're playing the uh, rich man's war, unlike in now where people celebrate Ukraine soldiers or Iraq and Afghanistan soldiers. It was a very difficult time for both well, the government honest, and the soldier. Well, yeah, although, you know, he does uh, buy into that whole myth that, like, um, returning... Um, uh, sorry, returning GIs were spat on by anti-war protesters and had were shouted at and everything. And of course, that actually wasn't true. That most of the actually anti-war actual anti-war protesters in during the Vietnam era had their friends and family in the in the war. And the reason why they opposed it is because they wanted to bring that home and not have them killed. Most of they did accuse people of being baby killers, people like LBJ and everything, and uh, Henry Kissinger, who I can't believe is still fucking alive, by the way. I know, go figure. At 100, I thought you would have been dead by now. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mentioned yeah, it. I mentioned it on my last podcast, where like there's this meme of a Grim Reaper saying, going on one of those claw machines, just going, "Come on, it has to be Henry Kissinger this time around. Has to be Henry Kissinger." Fuck. Oh wait, Pat Robertson. I'll take it. <laughs> well, even if you do get rid of the old fogies uh, that cause a lot of havoc, uh, there'll still be new fogies to come and terrorize well no we can brag about how our generation's much more progressive to the cows come home but it's not a blank sheet they're always going to have the more conservative and backward thinking elements who's keep to try to keep us uh well impede keep us behind and everything but um oh that reminds me speaking of our last week's podcast because now we're talking about um war movies and on the subject of world war ii movies last week i mentioned uh, uh, the imitation get no, Imitation Game. Oh, yes, of course. Um, which uh, is more of a behind the battlefield inside um, intelligence. It counts. But yes, that would qualify on some level because of the period it's set. Well, it was about the intelligence in the war and that um, it's set around World War Two, So it sort of counts as one. It's as much as a, a war film as the likes of uh, Born on the Fourth of July, which isn't about, um, well, does show a bit of a, the war but it's more about going back home but uh, no imitation game is about the war and the intelligence and the everything they went through to try and crack the enigma code and then um and finally turn the tides of war against nazi germany and ultimately win the war in, at all um but uh one of the scenes that really sticks out to me is basically when he finally cracked the code and figured out what the nazis are are doing what the uh u-boats are doing so they can figure so they can counter them they realize that a convoy's coming over and said oh they're going to attack them but they said oh cool well we can in we can impede uh impede it and we can uh not impede it uh intervene that's it and we can stop the attack but then he realizes yeah but if we do that or if we keep intervening with too uh interjecting or intervening with too many of their attacks they're going to know we've figured out their codes and then they'll change them. We have to start again. So they realize they actually have to keep up the ruse. They have to let some of the attacks be successful. And he tells this, um, the, the people in the room, one of whom has a, a brother on the ship that's being targeted. Sorry, they're going to, we're going to have to just, that one's going to have to take one for the team per se. We have to throw that one under the bus and we can't do save them I'm just saying that's something I remember from that uh, particular film hmm it's been quite a while since I've seen this so my memory well, I've seen it once uh, um, you seem quite invested <laughs> it's the history of uh, the Enigma and the relations between uh, the government and also military officers and intelligence trying to solve this operation but yes um that would be a part of uh, the discussion. Um, it's a standard type of 12A, I think, mainly because of... Um, well, there's no violence in it, really. It's just general that, bad language and everything. Yeah, it's a non-contentious one, although it's more the fact that Alan Turing was LGBT that's probably going to lightly uh, scare a lot of people more so than help him. Sometimes, if it's not the rating itself, it's something else externally that uh, has made people angry. In the same way that Little Mermaid we make, no one wants to watch it because it's got a, a sort of mixed race slash black 
lead character. The most, oh, yeah. In case of imitation game, it would be the LGBT context, which I'm sure older generations are a little bit iffy about. I know I saw it with a Ukrainian person when I was at university. He um, wasn't too particular or kind to some other, what he would call like the sort of politicking about his uh, sexual orientation. He was more interested in the sort of politics outside of that. But it's all intertwined one way or another, my friend. Uh, certain things you could or could not do. I know in on some respects, with wartime, it was a horrible time to be a woman. But at the same time, a lot more women were being filled in the gaps that the men couldn't in the workplace and um, building we bombs and uh, working in the factories. The whole we can do it thing. They try to help out on the effort. War bonds, all those posters that you keep seeing on there to help out the soldiers, fight the Nazis and Krauts, <laughs> all that jazz. But yes, um, very, very interesting stuff. But at the same time, women were always at the mercy of the, a lot of these events because of um, horrible rapes and attacks on poor people. Cities and houses were bombed. Still going on right now. Yeah, unfortunately, it was one of the side effects of wars, right? The, um, well, was the soldiers try to wait, rape, rape or try to attempt to rape uh, the women of the uh, territories they seize. And it, that is so bang out of order. I mean, there's just, you can think, I mean, you think of a lot of reasons why I might kill people or might hurt them. It's like there might be some pragmatic reason behind it. I, I don't think you should, but I mean, you know, it's like, well, I've got to kill these people because they want to kill me or if I, kill them then they won't better like kill us trying to kill us later on or just clear some room or there could be a plethora of reasons why you might want to kill or hurt someone and that's for hurting then you might do it to extract information you know you know the reasons there is no pragmatic or reason why you would ever rape someone as you know it's just purely for vile vindictive reasons they say like, as soon as um the Soviets took Berlin in 1945, yeah, the they there was just the Soviets just went on a huge ra- rape spree of the German women. It's ah, fucked up. In times of crisis, people will do anything just to try to get their way. No one really wants to help out their fellow man when all order is lost and the courts don't even exist because they're focused on trying to win the battle. It's since we're seeing that with uh, Ukraine right now. We've seen it in Bosnia. We've seen it in Iraq, Afghanistan, which is what Redactor was about. Vietnam had a fair few incidents to where they made the casualties of war and a film called OK, which got a lot of controversy to where the Berlin Film Festival in 1970 did not proceed further because the uh, people who were curating the festival did not on the show it because of its frank depiction of sexual assault by US veterans. I've just I just had it's a thought a actually. Sorry, film. Right, carry on. It's a horrible film. And uh, this is probably one of the only few areas where you'll see a war movie again. A teen certificate is if sexual violence is involved. Anything well, else, it's usually fifteen. Yeah. I mean yeah, well sexual violence is the kind of thing that does irk the BBFC and I've I've spoken about with Tom on a few of his podcasts. Of all the reasons to get irked and everything, that is probably one of the more, most understandable ones. Um, I did actually have a, a thought actually because we see all these um, war films and they're made in Western countries and everything. They're usually from the uh, from the perspective of the West. I've always wanted to see a, a Vietnam film from the uh, perspective of the Vietnamese or the Viet Cong mainly because it's great just to see the Americans being portrayed as bad guys, but uh, let's not get uh, too bogged down in that. I mean, probably in the future, we probably will see movies um, set during the Ukraine, Russia-Ukraine war, that can be from the Ukraine point of view, and that's, uh, you know, because that's quite a tale of heroism. But I remember, uh, I can't remember how long ago it was, uh, but Clint Eastwood at one point made two um, uh, World War Two movies back-to-back about the same battle there's flags of our fathers and letters from iwo jima both about the battle of iwo jima oh yes i remember when that came out i saw i believe flags of our fathers on the plane i have not seen letters from iwo jima that should have 
They didn't I've have seen... on the planet at the time. Uh, other way around with me. Okay, so you saw the Japanese one. Oh, yeah, so I saw it, letters uh, from Iwo Jima. I've not seen flags of our fathers. Hmm. Okay. What was the was experience like for you, whether it be the rating or just in general? The rating is, as you would expect to be, it's a 15. It was always going to be a 15. I mean, it's doubtly R-rated in America. I mean, again, it was going to be R-rated. Sometimes it's hard to think. If you don't go for these ratings, I mean, you're not really telling the proper story um, or properly displaying the war as it should be. That was a problem with Dunkirk because, like, you sent a war film. It's PG-13 slash 12A rated, rated, and it just kind of neuters it, if you think about it. Um, but uh, rating-wise, yeah, it was okay. It was just nice to see, like, the um, the war from uh, the, another perspective, even though the Japanese perspective in World War II probably isn't something you should really be trying to glorify. Well, not with um, their military missions against the Chinese, um, which they've got their problems too, but uh, it was a really sort of ugly battle and control for power uh, throughout uh, that part of the Pacific. Everyone was uh, tit for tat. It's essentially what geopolitics is all about. But speaking of Japan and their um, missions during that period of time, there was a film that came out called Men Behind the Sun, uh, which uh, has a bit of a reputation amongst uh, us uh, film censorship nerds as being one of the most violent and sadistic films ever made. Uh, Full-blown scenes of torture and uh, mutilation a man is put inside a hot oven of sorts, uh, uh, heated to death to where um, intestines fall out of the stomach and a woman has her uh, arms frozen and chipped away by soldiers. Um, Tears of the sun, did you say? Men behind the sun. Oh, men behind the sun. Oh, shit. Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> oh, it's all right there. I know Tears Behind the Sun, that's Antoine Fuqua, but yeah, Men Behind the Sun actually had to be censored in the UK for what I was told to uh, avoid being banned, to trim it at 18 even, which uh, is awfully telling because if it's a war movie, they usually tend to be a little bit more relaxed about things, but this one really pushed the envelope. There's probably one of the few 18 films, but this was at a time where James Furman was around, so he could yeah. tell with whatever he could. But at the same time, I've heard reports about James Furman and company being kind of relaxed about films like Platoon which I haven't seen, but that film, I was told, has a lot of violence and language and drug use. At the time, for a 15, that was unprecedented. Officer and a gentleman had uh, two, like one or two uses of the C word, which you, know, you never heard in a double A or 15 film. Certainly not as much as you do now. I'm actually a little surprised, but then again, with Nail and I, that was from the 80s, that got a 15, that had like one or two uses of that word. Wait, which film did you say again? Officer, Whitman. yeah, Whit Nile and I. It's, it's a bit how like. Do you, how, how do you spell that? Um, w I T H N A I L. Oh, with Nile and I. Yeah, it, it, I, I pronounce things a little differently, but yeah, it's Whit Nile and I. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I've just, uh, I've just looked it up. But yes, um. You know, different sort of standards, but at the same time, Full Metal Jacket, Hamburger Hill, Casualties of War, a lot of these films were still given 18s, as was Apocalypse Now, but Apocalypse Now can now be seen in secondary schools at GCSE level, A level, so a whole lot has changed since then. Uh, I know I got in a bit of trouble for watching Full Metal Jacket, weirdly enough, and I must have been like 16 or 17 when I saw it, which I guess was a little strange because... When I when I grew up, Full Metal Jacket was always a uh, 18 certificate film because of the violence and language and some of the sexual stuff. But um, yeah, that was a, a bit of a weird one. I'll, I'll tell you that. But um, Vietnam, I think I discussed. Well, I know we were talking about Death Watch a little bit earlier. I wanted to mention about it because I interviewed the filmmaker on my YouTube. Um, hopefully, he can sign it, my DVD copy of it in case if he stops on by him. And that one was a really unusual one. It's fine at 15, but uh, I know some people say it's got the supernatural elements and stuff, but I did not see it that way. I saw it as a metaphor for PTSD on the battlefield. 
and all these men sort of each at each other's throats. It deals with sort of class as well because the rich officers are uh, baking pot shots and more the working class or regional officers who are like from the north or uh, Scotland, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's a quite a ruthless film, but it gets you talking. And, you know, it's part of the sort of war horror group of things, which um, that was a bit of a weird one for the censors to try and deal with. Because you, know, you start talking about films like Overlord and Dead Snow, which is Norwegian, and a few others. And many of those are 18 certificates because the uh, her context behind them is not appropriate enough to justify a 15. It's seen as exploitative. Well, I mean, I... Well, yeah, obviously those ones are um, those ones are less about the war and more about the uh, well, I suppose exploitative horror regarding it. So yeah, that that tracks. You probably have experience with um because I've seen Overlord at the cinema. I was one of the few people who did, and I um was trying to wonder hmm, what exactly is all eighteen about this until. The scene of the man's face being smashed with the butt of a rifle came out. And I thought, oh, that was gruesome. Later on, the uh, scenes regarding the more zom- the zombies and everything, and you see that uh, German that German sergeant, commander, captain, I don't know what fucking rank he was, you see his face with like a huge hole in it, everything going right through it, and you're realising, yeah, okay, I, I, I get it, I get it, I, I understand. Um, just, I just suddenly remi- remembered uh, one film. You say about what you were watching in school now, and you got in trouble. I remember at one time when I was at school because we were going through a point um, that we had the sort of trifecta. In, in English, we were studying Anne Frank's diary. In history, we were studying World War Two, and in religious religious education classes, we were studying Judaism. So of course, um, we just uh, they should let us watch uh, Schindler's List. Um, yeah, so yes, yeah, so we watched uh, Schindler's List. I know that one. Yeah, you know, that's one of Steven Spielberg's uh, most well-regarded films. It's actually one of his few R-rated titles. Um, I mean, even years later, it's it's still quite disturbing. It's still ruthless. Um, no mistake in that. But what was the controversy behind it for you? Because did you not see it when you were fifteen, or like they showed it to you at like twelve, or well? We were in year, we were in year nine, so we were fourteen, or some of us may have still been thirteen. Um, they were asking, they even asked our parents if we could watch, if it was okay for us to watch it, and they all signed off on it and everything. But I think actually more formality. I think most people are okay with our kids watching Schindler's List. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously we could see why it was a fit nonetheless. It was a violent movie, and it had some swearing and everything, but which we had a big laugh at and everything. But and there's even nudity in it, but. Um, Albeit not like in a sexualizing way or anything, but yeah, I mean, blimey, you could see the violence, and it really hammers it home. And it does at the end, you do start to realize, "Wow, well, Schindler, you done good, man. You, you did good." Uh, and of course, he's like, because at the end, he's actually crying because he could, he's still at his car and he's still at his ring, and he's like, he could have sold them and he could have like bought, he could have uh, bought more well, Jews from the. Um, uh, concentration camps to work in his uh, f- work in his factories, which of course would have saved them from from death. Uh, but of course, there was like several hundred Jews there in his factories who, if not for him, would have been killed. So it's just well, it makes you think. Well, it makes you reflect. No, absolutely, it does. Uh, you know, many people hold that film in high regard. So as to why. Even though I don't talk about it as much, but uh, yeah, it's a, a very difficult one. But uh, I think we didn't have that same experience at my school. We were shown The Pianist. We didn't have to have a permission slip for that one because at the time I saw it, I was 16, I believe. So yes, um, but I know The Pianist uh, is quite controversial because of the director, who we will not talk about. I haven't seen it again. I don't really know much about the film, so I wouldn't talk about it much either, to be honest. Roman Polanski made it, but one Adrian. Brody okay, got... that's okay. Enough said. Yeah, we. Oh, oh. So he's you know he's proudly Jewish. Um, 
he grew up in Poland, dead France, so you know he's making his testimony in the eyes of uh, Wolodyszlo Spielman, who uh, was the character inside it. Then we were shown Save a Private Ryan, but everyone seemed to be all excited about the first 20 minutes of that movie, which I thought, oh, that's that's pretty cynical. You just want to see people being shot and their intestines exposed on D-Day Beach. There's a bit of gruesome morbidity, especially when you look on YouTube comment sections. You've got people sort of saying like, oh, that was awesome, oh, that was cool, almost treat violent scenes in movies as if it's like pornography. So there's a bit of a weird s- sickness behind that. Uh, well, I mean, like I say, not seen the film, can't comment. So, I mean, uh, that's all I can really say about that, I'm afraid. All right, then. No, no pressure there. Another, f- pressure. Uh, also, have you seen Enemy at the Gates? No. Okay, that's just another war film I just only thought of. It's set during the Battle of Stalingrad. It's actually a British film, and of course everyone sounds British in it, apart from Ed Harris's character, who sounds American, even though it's Soviets versus Germans. Well, I guess they got him to market the film a little bit more, because I... Where's Jude Law in it? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think he's the main character. And okay, Rachel that... Weisz is in it as well. I was probably to try to help sell the film. It's like getting Andy McDowell or um, uh, Julia Roberts to be in Notting Hill. Well, if it was just a British actor, it wouldn't have sold. Bob Hoskins is in it as well. As well. Oh, uh, Bob Hoskins R.I.P. of course. But um, no, I mean, when you're, I've only seen the film once and I think I was a little drunk when I watched it. But I can remember just seeing just holy fuck it does not pull any punches about just how grueling and just ruling the battle of stalingrad was uh, just like every last victory was just gained meter by bloody meter it's just just for every just people just drop like flies around them. it it was almost like a fucking meat grinder and uh but hey I mean, the soviets held and then the not the third reich's uh, wehrmacht got absolutely crushed there and it yeah turned the tide of a war As you do there, as you do. I, I know that sounds a bit vague of me to say that, but um, I don't know too much about Enemy at the Gates. But I'll, I'll take your word for it about um, what what goes on in that particular film. <laughs> well, war movies quite abound. Uh, you get to hear different perspectives on the the frontier and at the front. Um, could be quite difficult, really. Now, on on the flip side, let's sort of lighten it up a bit. War comedies. Because I know I mentioned earlier on MASH and Team America World Police. What were your experience with, like, war comedies? <laughs> well, I haven't That's seen... Include I Dad's haven't, Army. Well, I haven't seen MASH. Um, I've seen... Well, I watched a lot of Dad's Army on on TV. I watched a, I watched a movie. I thought it was okay. Um, well, I get That's being generous, I think. Team America World Police... Well, I don't know so much a war movie, it's just a parody of action movies, and it, it was funny and everything. I don't know if it's particularly held up quite well today, especially seeing as it ultimately seems to be singing praises of America's foreign interventions in the Middle East, which now we've acknowledged as just being shit. I mean, but no, I mean, it, it is funny. It is, I mean, I saw it at the cinema, uh, I had been hysterics. Um, especially the songs America, fuck yeah, which I cannot believe people have just now sing unironically. Obviously, it was like a, a send up of like, the over patriotism of, well, of the time in America, but also these Amer- uh, Hollywood action movies that involve around uh, America's foreign policy. And now, of course, like it's just been that song has just been played straight. People are actually singing it to actually big up the USA. I actually not heard it in that sort of context there. That's a bit weird. Maybe there. maybe I think I have, or I'm just and it hasn't been. I don't know. I'm just uh, I kind of spitballing off the cuff here a little bit, Mark. Oh no fears, no worries there. I know I could go on about Team America for about twenty minutes, but yeah, I'm a little jealous of you that you got to see it at the cinema, but I couldn't because uh, I was not fifteen yet, and. Uh, that was the movie I really wanted to see because it was animated and it had puppetry. But um, yeah, it, it still bothers me a little bit. You got to see that and South Park. 
but that we'll talk about that to the side. <laughs> well, yeah, we can. And um, just but to yeah, it, it, it is a war movie on my level because it deals with sort, of, sort of Iraq Afghanistan era type of politics. And then you know Kim Jong Un was pretty much the leader at the time, but yeah, the whole war on terror, nine post nine eleven climate. Kim Jong Kim Jong Il, wasn't it? Yep, that's him. I thought you said Kim Jong Un. Huh? I'm getting mixed up with the interview, but yes, so Kim Jong Il, you are you are correct. After Kim <laughs> Il Sung, yes, um, it, you know you could even say about Fahrenheit nine eleven. That's a war movie. I saw that in the cinema as well. I hate you. That's it. Yeah. I'm not friends. <laughs> no, no I, at the time I was going for a big, I was a big fan of Michael Moore and everything. And uh, I'd watched Bottom for Columbine. I'd read his book, Stupid White Men and Dude, Where's My Country? I really wanted to go see um, uh, Fahrenheit 9 11. And of course, me and my mum went to see it and everything. My mum didn't find it quite as enjoyable. She found him to be incredibly biased. Yeah, okay, she's kind of right. I suppose on reflection, I suppose. Yeah, Michael Moore can be a little bit unnuanced and reductive of a lot of his um takes, but uh, you know, it was my introductory into uh, my um, left wing politics, which have evolved, shall we say, uh, from a little bit of um, well, just angsty teenager stuff. Well, I mean, uh, I got into the same thing as you. Uh, yeah, I was uh, fourteen, fifteen when I got into Michael Moore stuff uh, quite a bit. I think that's when they've seen Sicko um, at the time. I thought that was brilliant. But at the same time, his view on NHS is a bit monged. We've got long waiting lines by a friend in the UK and not all procedures are being covered. Um, there's yeah, I, some private be, transition, but we to have to be honest, dude, I think US. that's more. To be honest, dude, I think that's more due to the last 13 years of Tory cuts rather than anything else. No, you're right. Toys okay. Have you seen s- All right, Mark. Have you seen Black Hawk Down? No. That's about Somalian mission, right? The Battle of Mogadishu. Yeah, unfortunately for me, that one is not one I've seen. That's how you seen. pronounce it. Right? I, I it's got a cool soundtrack. Mogadishu. You're correct. No, it's just that I've seen that once or twice. My brother likes to watch it, so we've watched it with him. I think every time I've watched it, though, I have we have been absolute had an absolute skinful. So I really can't comment too much or remember about it. Um, yeah, that's a yeah. I mean, my brother was I always said I can't believe this got a fifteen, but it's, I was like, yeah, dude, you know, war film. They tend to be a little bit more lenient. Plus, the BBFC aren't dicks anymore. I suppose that's all I've got to say about it. I could also bring up that anime I've watched, Golden Kumai, which is set in the aftermath of a Russo-Japanese war. Um, but there's not a huge amount to say about that, so it's more just a Western rather than an actual war film or war, well, war anime. Uh, well, anime and course, war films, you, know, you think of Waltz of Bashir or Grave of the Fireflies, which... Uh, I need to watch that. Ghibli film, that's a 12 certificate, which kind of took me by surprise. Because the only one that is graphic content is concerned, it's not as bloody as Princess Mononoke or Plague Dogs, and those were PG back then. It was mm-hmm. well, Princess right. Mononoke and Plague Dogs still is PG, but uh, that those aren't war movies, so we'll just move further on. But uh, yes, um, one thought, got... uh, one thought I've had is that. Uh, it's generally considered to be a trope. It's not actually much, actually a trope that's been used that much. But of course, you know, we you certainly fil- a film during uh, set during Vietnam or much popular culture set during Vietnam. They have lots. They play all the sort of um, all the sort of soundtrack of the time or everything. And of course, one of the most uh, famous songs is "Fortunate Son" by um, was it Clear Dance Clear Water Festival or Clear Dance Water Festival? Like- Credence Clear Water Revival. Fuck, that's it. I I got no idea, mate. <laughs> um, yeah. My mother, she's a fan of seventies music. <laughs> she's I remember. A girl. That era. Uh, well, that sounds that tracks. Um, I remember I'm saying like twenty years ago that oh, Iraq could be the next Vietnam. Let's not hope not. Or is uh some shit movies in ten years time? Um, but of course, recently the Afghan war finished. 
And of course, that's America's longest war to date, far longer than they were ever in Vietnam for. I'm just, I was so, I remember I did quite facetiously post on Facebook, huh, I wonder what the what films they'll um, have regarding it, and what will be their equivalent of Fortunate Son? <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't think there's really an equivalent, really, because uh, certain songs uh, have a bit of a touch on milestone of that particular decade. Plus, the, the youth movement was certainly a lot stronger and probably more powerful in the 70s and late 60s than it was, let's say, in the 2000s. It just wasn't there, really. I've heard more songs about um, uh, black liberation or LGBT pride than I hear about anti-war themes. Unless you... Well, there was American Idiot by Green Day. Mosh by uh, Eminem. Well, yeah, that and, um, as I've just mentioned, I don't know if you caught it, but uh, Green Day's American Idiot. Oh, God, don't remind me of that song. I was bullied... Everyone, they kept singing that song at me because I'm partially American and I hated it every single day because they would bully me because of George Bush and the war on terror but yet they didn't show that backlash at Tony Blair who was also involved so oh let me fucking start on that git they always say if it weren't for actually um, the war in Iraq Tony Blair might have had an actually better legacy and everything but it's been completely tarnished by the fact that he just took us into that I, I, I don't I don't want to get too ranty and everything, but fuck him. Um, but yeah, I totally get you. Yeah, um, that's the period of my life I want to forget. If There's I, also it, the compilation albums Rock Against Bush 1 and 2. Uh, but I don't know. I think a lot of the songs might have actually been written beforehand and everything. That's just something I'm throwing out there. Oh, no. Well, actually, you just reminded me. <laughs> the Dixie Chicks. <laughs> and yeah. that's music wise but it does pertain to a lot of this because their views on the Iraq war and George Bush cost them their career they were blacklisted and banned from country radio and they're even now blacklisted by the left as well because of the word Dixie so they just are now known as the chicks but yeah it's a now very controversial legacy uh, of a band that maybe opened their mouth up a little bit and it cost them their career. Um, that didn't happen with Bruce Springsteen, obviously because he's a man and he probably sells more um, uh, records than the Dixie Chicks ever did, but he did Born in the USA and that was a song that was quite critical of uh, uh, you know, American policy. Yeah, but I don't think they realised that. I think they actually thought he was actually being uh, pro-war and uh well, supporting the, the Vietnam War and everything. My, yeah, uh, you're, you're right. My apologies, because uh, there was a little bit of irony surrounding that. They thought it was, you know, yeah, America. You can't say about Edwin Starr's war what is good for absolutely nothing. That was banned on uh, military radios in that uh, period of Iraq and Afghanistan. But yet yeah, they still played it in movies. I first heard it in Rush Hour and Small Soldiers, and I hold a a very positive um, response to that particular song. It's actually one of my favourites. That's why I did it at the beginning. I was like, ah! oh, I see, I see. But that's I just, one of the seminal, is, uh, Vietnam songs. Uh, yeah, I've just suddenly had a huge, uh, huge thought. Have you ever listened to the works of a comedian, Bill Hicks? People compare him to Alex Jones, or so it seems that Bill Hicks became Alex Jones. But yes, yeah. I've heard of him a few times. Have you ever heard any any of his stuff? Only in extracts or segments. I'm All afraid. right. I just basically, even though he died in uh, back in 1994, nearly 30 years ago, and uh, yeah, that was quite sad. He was only 32. I'm now older than he ever was. Um, far older than he ever was, actually. He. What was I going with us? Uh, yeah, one of his um peak of his um, career was during the first Gulf War and uh, it was dur during the administration of Bush Senior and of course he was highly critical of it and uh, one of the things he always talked about was how we, during the Iran-Iraq War, we sold weapons to Saddam Hussein and of course, um, as I say during the second, Go uh, during the Iraq War with George Bush Junior needless to say, he like he became a lot of, he became incredibly popular again because it sounded just like he was talking 
he was talking about the, about uh, well the current times, and um, yeah, it was just the area. And of course, a lot of his jokes about the uh, the war were his critiques of war were incredibly funny. I love the way just once what he said. I was in the in the unenviable position of being for the war but against the troops. Yeah, yeah it's a quite a, a rough, ironic joke there. Blimey. Oh yeah. Well, that's not. That's just a throwaway joke. That's just a little bit uh, being a bit facetious. He also said that the goal, first Gulf War was never a war because a war is when two armies are fighting. He's got a little bit of a point there because uh, quite a point. What we have, especially in recent years, are proxy wars that are being fought by one power, but it's ultimately supported by another. It's what happened in Angola, but uh, after it's independence for Portugal, you had Russian Cuban forces and American finance forces fighting for control of Angola. And then obviously Ukraine right now, Americans aren't directly involved except for a few mercenaries, but it's now a war of geopolitical influence. And Look at Syria. Theory. Well, same as Syria, really, when you think about it. Oh, no, you're right. Certain groups are being uh, financed and supported by certain Others. I know Bashar al-Assad is a Putin ally. I don't think he makes any mistake about it. I think there are some troops. I probably should do my research a little bit better, but I think some of the groups that are in Raqqa or Idlib that are fighting against uh, ISIL or Daesh were financed by the West. So I know America and even France like to have its hand in on the, trying to uh, send proxy elements to fight certain conflicts. Yeah, we have. We've been trying to trying to um, fund the rebels. The problem is, though, is that the rebels aren't particularly moderate anymore, and it's and of course Saudi Arabia has been trying to fund any sort of militant Sunnis in there fighting against uh, fighting against Assad, and of course Iran being Shia is like supporting Assad against any sort of uh, Sunni is uh, militant Sunniism, and ISIS was the they're just basically waiting for Assad to fall so they could take it. Or anyway, it's all a bit of a um, bit of complete quagmire. You just can't you can't tell what's the right side to be on. But um, other than just not ISIS, uh, yeah, but that's that. Anyway, it's not related to films. So I mean, but it's related to war. I mean, there's been documentaries about the Syrian civil war experience with um, uh, for Sama, uh, City of Ghosts. They were actually 18 certificate documentaries. Can you believe that? Not just because if it's a, a documentary is 18, it may be because of the sexual content or there's a lot of C words. No, nope, actually it was for real scenes of violence, including dismemberment and torture. So that's awfully telling. Yeah. I don't think I mean that's the I didn't even thought that was possible because the problem is is with documentaries, a lot of footage they could probably obtain. You could watch it on the evening news, put it on news now, you'll sometimes get some pretty graphic reports about uh, people being caught in a car bomb in Kabul and several mm. others. It's uh, quite nasty. I know, but, they do try to give content warnings beforehand, but I do see a point. I do see a point. I just suddenly remembered, you know how earlier I mentioned about um, most of these wars being from a Western point of view and being from our point of view, and of course, you don't get much from... It'd be nice to uh, see it from another side's point of view to s just to see how they see things, which led me into letters from Iwo Jima. Um, well, anyway, uh, last year, I mean, turns out the highest grossing film in China uh, was ever released. It was called... Sorry, no, not, not last year, but actually back in... 2021, so two years ago, uh, came out was the the battle at Lake Changjin. I think that's how you pronounce it. The battle at Lake Changjin. I'm not too familiar with that one. I, I know there was a film called Operation Red Sea, which is one of the few war movies I'm aware of that's an 18 certificate because it was just so bloody and relentless. And this was passed as appropriate for. The Chinese public, because in this in mainland China, they don't have a rating system. Everything has to be approved for all ages, which yeah, is a bit of a, a cultural distance because a lot of films <laughs> that have come out from the mainland have been past fifteen. I think one or two of them, like Red Sea, was eighteen even, which uh, 
makes you wonder. Well, it was a propaganda film by uh, the CCP, so maybe that's a little different. Falun Gong does not like it, but that's beside the point. But you were saying? Well, I mean, I haven't seen Operation Rose. I've seen I've seen one or two um, uh, Chinese uh, uh, in China films. They've generally got away with a. Uh, they've been rated fifteen and everything, but that's not. Yeah, but um, no, I mean, just saying, it's a battle of Lake Changjin, and it's um, <clears throat> it's uh, the Chinese war film and everything. It's about the battle at uh, Chosin Reservoir during the Korean War, and of course, it's a uh, it it was a battle between China versus um, us, the Americans, and South Koreans, and the Chinese won. And of course, so to them, it's like a big patriotic thing. Just I, I haven't seen it. I mean, it's just. It would just be, might be, it sounds to be quite interesting. Even though it would be blatant propaganda, I mean, could it be any more propaganda than a lot of our war movies are? Not really. I mean, we like to say we are leaders of democracy. Well, when you have generals uh, pre vetting what a film has before it gets an exhibition, that's not really democratic. It's still sort of state control. One way or another, you can. You can look at it one or two ways, my friend. But yes, that's that's just me rambling on. But uh, you got to be careful with a lot of these films, really, because they're, you know, content-wise, it's maybe another story, but a uh, political sort of perspective and view, you might uh, not be getting the whole picture. Because in all fairness, people want to see movies and TV shows that confirm their worldview. I'm no different. You know how the reason why I like God Bless America so much? Because it's wish fulfillment for most people on the far left. But they'll never tell you that. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 oh, yeah, totally, it is. I mean, I was just watching it at the time being, and, of course, all the people that it was, like, just pointing out that get shot by that guy and the girl he's with are just the kind of guys who just think, yeah, that just people just fucking up society and everything, such as members of Fox News or these you know, horrible um, religious fundamentalists, all the kind of people you saw in my super sweet 16, um, <clears throat> who I don't really think deserve to be killed. But I mean, yeah, that's, but yeah, I totally understand. But of course, that's a little off topic. So probably get back on the subject of war films. Or I don't, uh, I don't know which, where much further we're going with them. How much more we we're... Talked about war comedies. War dramas, war horror. Um, I know war horror in the video game realm is actually is quite popular with Wolfenstein, the new order, which is Peggy 18. They had to cut and, f- and censor a few things for the German market because they played the swastika on it. But uh, know. yeah, although to be fair, war for war games in general tend to just just plain set war games tend to be quite popular. I mean, don't get me started on the whole Call of Duty. Yeah, about that. Uh, I've been seeing games like that being used as recruitment tools for young lads to fight in the uh, front lines because um, I think uh, the Royal Army came to our school one time to show us uh, how it's like to uh, join their forces so they could get recruitments at GCSE level and then when I was at university in America I think the Marines they came by and there are TC camps to try and recruit young lads to fight um, or join their forces as well. Because if you have a university degree, you can join as an officer. If you don't, you're kind of stuck in the sort of lower level realms like infantrymen or uh, at the kitchen or something like that. But still, people will find ways to get people into recruits, be it through the most little list of things. That's why uh, people on the internet get radicalized in the far right ideology because. It's widespread through chat forums. They play these violent video games and they say, do you wish you could do this to all these fucking muzzies or uh, towel heads? Pardon the language. And then this all leads into a rabbit hole, a rabbit hole echo chamber of radicalism. And then you, and that starts a war and boom. One of the reasons why Nazism became popular because Germany got poor through mm-hmm. fighting. They had to um, pay back any sort of debts they did from the First World War, which ultimately led to uh, reactionary politics to try to filter through because the people were so desperate for some sort of change because of their poverty or their lack of mobility 
they turn to radical ideology just to get by, and that radical ideology radicalizes them, and they've done a coup, and that leads to sort of imperialist ideology. Russia sort of fell in that step when they became disillusioned with uh, neoliberal capitalism, which led to Putin, and so on and so forth, and actions against Crimea, and uh, Chechnya, and now Ukraine. That's, oh, well, exhausting. that is true. That is true. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not really a test that I think it's what most people do know. But yeah, I mean, that is how people go down these rabbit holes. And and of course, I mean, <clears throat> we mentioned earlier about a lot of these war movies are quite proper uh, propaganda. And of course, there's a link that has been linked in Hollywood and the Pentagon who have basically said, OK, you can use all this cool military tech, but you have to portray the military positively, which is um, exactly how you get films like Top Gun, which caused uh, Navy recruitment to basically skyrocket. <clears throat> and um and yeah stuff yeah like well yeah i mean i don't know not much more to add to that really well i mean about that i know tom he likes top gun maverick i have not seen it i, I, I don't choose to but i would presume the reason why it done so well at the box office is because it promotes a positive center center right narrative because a lot of people were getting all hung up about woke movies and stuff at that time, and they still are nowadays. But I guess part of Top Gun 2's success was that it wasn't trying so hard to put a message. It was just appealing to Gen X nostalgia and to uh, sort of American exceptionalism. And, and then of course, Ukraine think, happened, and that sort of uh, propelled a few things. And, of course, it wasn't a superhero movie, and, of course the superhero fatigue may have been kicking in just a little bit. Oh, I I certainly believe that. Um, Well, I mean, people still want to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, but it didn't do quite as big business as Shazam 2. And I'm sure The Flash right now probably won't be doing as big business as Endgame. Fat chance. Now, I know this is not related to war movies, but The Flash... (laughs) We can talk about because of Ezra Miller. How is this going to um, go about things as far as the public is concerned? Because I don't think people care that much about what Ezra Miller did. I'm sure it's probably a black stain on everyone else. Uh, I couldn't tell. It depends how good the film actually is. Right now, it's uh, Tomato Meter isn't. Um doing to i mean it's better than some blows better than say uh ant-man of the wasp was doing but currently in the tomato meter it's standing at 66 percent oh that's i mean i know it's not rotten but that's not that great i don't think that's i'm probably not gonna i don't think i'm gonna go see it now to be honest uh, I thought it was in the 70s a few days ago. I thought, okay, I might better salvage something out of that. But 66 just thinks, makes you think, nah, I, I, that's not really good enough to worth watching. Putting money to see anyway. Hey, money is tight nowadays. Got to squeeze by every penny that you can make of it. But yes, um, I, I just wanted to mention that just for, for a brief second because I know Ezra Miller and the whole legal issues and probably imprisonment he will face has been in the headlines quite a lot. So I'm sure if anyone who is curious, we just wanted to get that out of the way before we end this wonderful podcast that we got to do about war movies. We could yeah, have talked about. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think we even began to scratch the surface on war movies. I mean, as a genre, it's pretty extensive. I mean, if we just go, I mean, we could just talk about 10% of the World War II movies out there and we could probably be here all day. I mean, it's just... It's a little bit too much to go over, really, to just get in one single podcast. Yeah, but I think we gave as best as we could on all that. Oh, no, absolutely. Because I know there's certain films that you didn't see and ones that I haven't, so we tried to meet sort of halfway within that respect. So... Um... I think some of the times I probably have mentioned in the past already, like Walter Bashir, which got an 18 certificate just for a silly little sex scene that was explicit, but it was animated. And I've seen much worse in 15 films, live action or animated, so I thought that was a bit overblown. But I've talked about it in the past already, so we can brush that one aside. But uh, yes, it's almost endless, really. 
But if you talk about the mild stuff like dam busters at the U level or hardcore stuff at 18, like uh, Glorious Bastards, Man for Lord, and Casualties of War, that's beside the point. Anyways, thank you for stopping on by. And uh, in case the world does end because of nuclear explosion, I actually am looking forward to it. I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of eternal suffering. Well, I think uh, I think we can uh, I can be afra- we can be afraid of both to be honest, and uh, I certainly I mean I don't want the world to go end a nuclear fireball, but I can't imagine it it will. As for uh, everything else, yeah, I don't know. I think of it. I think I've exhausted all I have to say on any of this subject right now for the time being. All right then. Well, I better get back to my paranoia. And wishing that Putin killed all of us so we can re-cleanse the planet even further. And before anyone interjects, right, no hands in the audience, I say this meeting has been adjourned. <laughs>